Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and we thank you again for tuning in to the program. <clears throat> Yesterday, we concluded uh, our uh, with a discussion about uh, the Iraq War and conditions, failing conditions for quote-unquote Christians in Iraq after the war. And by the way, we're reading from the book The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. And uh, the Vatican had a strategy for Iraq. The United States had a strategy for Iraq. Can I understand those strategies were parallel? And that's uh, the whole gist of this book, to describe how the United States actually constitutes the the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. And while the papacy publicly stood aloof and <clears throat> called for peace and seemed somewhat critical of the United States for its actions against Iraq, we know that the Vatican plans <clears throat> for the Middle East <clears throat> include taming the Middle East for a papal occupation. And Saddam Hussein represented a threat. And the United States took him out. Who benefited? The Roman Catholic Church. And I'm told from other researchers, particularly Eric John Phelps, that Saddam Hussein had gotten on the hit list of the Vatican when he ousted the Jesuits from his country who were trying to establish a Federal Reserve type bank for Iraq. And so all of this to do in the book, the public information, is just cover for that reality. And that's very believable given the uh, situation regarding other conflicts in history. The papacy's agendas are always different than what it publicly states, and that includes even the United States, who gives false pretenses to justify war for the benefit of the papacy. But nonetheless, the concern was the welfare of quote-unquote Christians in Iraq, and he said and continuing uh, on the first full paragraph on page 159, if you're following along. He said, I heard similar concerns when I met Iraq's ambassador to the Holy See, Albert Yelta, Yelda, excuse me, a few months later. Ambassador Yelda was an Assyrian Christian descended from ancient inhabitants of the Euphrates Valley. Like Chaldean Christians who were themselves ethnic Assyrians, his people had lived in Mesopotamia almost since the time of Christ. The ambassador was concerned that they would, that they would not last there much longer because of uh, quote-unquote Christian persecution. Now it says conditions for Christians did indeed deteriorate through the rest of 2005 and 2006. On January 29, 2006, car bombs were detonated in front of four Christian churches in Baghdad and Mosul and others in front of the residents of the Vatican's nuncio in Iraq. Okay, Car bombs in front of the Vatican's nuncio in Iraq. So you can imagine that these other so-called Christian churches are Catholic churches or churches friendly to the Catholic Church. Now it says, unfortunately, this, this violence continues unabated to the present. On October 31st, 2010, bombs went off in, Baghdad Cathe in the Baghdad Cathedral, killing more than 50 Syriac Christians and has spread throughout the Middle East. On January 1st, 2011, <clears throat> 23 Coptic Christians were murdered while attending services in Alexandria. Similar attacks have continued to occur throughout the region. 
mornings often meant, <clears throat> says this author in, in part four of this chapter, which is entitled To the Vatican, he says mornings often meant going to the Vatican to meet Curia officials. Visiting the Vatican is a unique and memorable experience, but in those early days I was often too preoccupied with the task at hand to fully take in the surroundings. I would return from a visit at the Secretary of State's office to try to make notes of what I had seen there, but with little success at first. Even the most observant visitor would be likely to find the Apostolic Palace a, com a complicated maze. I usually entered the palace the same way I had come from the credentialing, through the Cortile San Damaso, or else by the large Belvedere courtyard at the back of the Apostolic Palace. The entire conjoined complex of Vatican buildings extends north from St. Peter's Basilica and includes the archives, library, and museum, along with miles of corridor and thousands of rooms. But the Apostolic Palace is the heart of the operation. In addition to the Pope's private residence and the numerous marbled salas and frescoed loges, the palace, the palace houses the key administrative offices of the Vatican. Small mahogany paneled elevators carried me to these offices on the third floor. I would be met by one of the staff of the Secretary of State who would escort me through the loges that surround the Cortile San Damaso, then down a hall to one of the several small meeting rooms. No matter which meeting room I was taken to, the custom never varied. The door was closed behind me, I waited a few minutes, and then the door opened again, and the official I had come to meet entered and greeted me, and we sat down and, and got down to business. In those early days, I'd learned the decorum and habits of the Vatican. A lot of my effort went into figuring out its organizational structure. As one Vatican insider recently states, quote, the Vatican is a ball of wool that, almost, that is almost impossible to untangle, even by a pope, unquote. One simple fact is that all power in the Vatican emanates from the pope. He is the head of state of Vatican City, that tiny territory with its own post office, bank, and police force, and a population of about 1,000, and of the sovereign institution of the Holy See. He is also the chief priest of a worldwide religion. The chief priest of a worldwide religion. The chief priest of a counterfeit kingdom that is believed to be Christian, I will add. And it says his domain is far greater than the territory he rules. It is the entire Catholic Church governed under the auspices of the Holy See. He says what must be almost tongue-in-cheek here, his, his domain is far greater than the territory he rules. The Roman Catholic Church believes that the papacy has power not only over the earth, but over heaven and over hell. And those three jurisdictions, earth and heaven and hell, are depicted on the papal tiara, the triple crown. So, with tongue-in-cheek, this author admits, his domain is far greater than the territory he rules. As discussed earlier in these pages, the possession of Vatican City embellishes the Holy See's sovereignty, but its sovereignty does not depend on its territory. The Holy See, as the governing body of the universal Catholic Church, would survive if it had no land to call its own. It did survive without land for nearly 60 years between the fall of the Papal States in 1870 and the Lateran Treaty of 1929. In any case, the Pope holds a position of huge symbolic and ceremonial importance. From nuts and bolts bureaucratic decisions to great theological disputes, from the setting the general direction of the church to performing specific religious functions, 
The Pope is the person in whom final authority is vested. That's right. No mention of Jesus Christ here. Only the Vicar of Christ. He says there is no separation of powers in the Vatican. Every chain of command leads ultimately to him, the Pope. Right? You draw the organizational structure of the Roman Catholic Church, all roads lead to the Pope. Uh, every link comes from the Pope. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords of that church. He says, to perform his many duties, the Pope depends on a staff called the Curia. The Curia is composed of approximately 600 employees, including clergy of all ranks and levels and lay people, many of whom both work and live inside the Vatican. These officials are dispersed among the numerous congregations, councils, and tribunals collectively known as dicasteries that oversee various responsibilities and jurisdictions. One of the nine congregations, for example, is the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, formerly under the direction of then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Other, others include the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples and the Congregation for Catholic Education. The tribunals deal with excommunications, annulments, and similar matters. Unlike the American judiciary, which operates as a separate branch of the government, the tribunals answer to the Pope. <clears throat> the dicastery that works most closely with the Pope in his administration of the Church is the Secretariat of State. Through this dicastery of dicasteries, as it is often called, the Holy See communicates with the larger Catholic Church and the world at large. The highest ranking member of the Curia, the man second only to the Pope, is the Cardinal Secretariat of State. Centuries ago, when nepotism was the rule inside the Vatican, this position was known as the Cardinal Nephew. The Cardinal Nephew. Now let me explain a little bit about the Cardinal Nephew. The Popes were not allowed to marry. And they were not allowed, by that right, to, you know, propagate children. But nearly all of them did. And so they passed off their progeny as nephews. In other words, that they were born of their, brother, their brothers. <coughs> and being that they were truly the Pope's son, the Pope took care of his son by promoting his quote-unquote nephew to cardinal status and making him Secretary of State of Vatican City. That's why the Secretary of State is often referred to as the cardinal nephew. All right, in fact, the, world, the word, the very word nepotism is derived from the Italian word for nephew, nepote, to capture the once common familial relationship between popes and their advisors. The Cardinal Secretary really runs the day-to-day -day operations of the Church, <clears throat> functioning as a combination of Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary, and leaving the Pope to set broad strategy and tend to his important spiritual role as head of the Church. When I became Ambassador in 2005, says Rooney, the man in this job was the long-serving Cardinal Angelo Sedano. The Secretary of State is divided into two divisions. The General Section, also called the Section for quote-unquote ordinary affairs, or the First Section, and accounts for the matters that are intra-church, which is to say matters of administration of the worldwide Catholic Church. The head of the first section, known as the Sestuto, the substitute, is generally the third most powerful figure inside the Vatican, after the Pope and the Secretary of State. He essentially acts as Chief of Staff, the channel between the Curia and the Pope, deciding which issues and problems are brought to the attention of the Pope. Archbishop Leonardo Sandri, an Argentinian, held this position when I was in Rome, and much of the world got its first glimpse of Archbishop Sandry on the evening of April 2nd, 2005, when he stepped out of the front entry of St. Peter's 
Basilica onto the piazza to announce the death of Pope John Paul II. For my purposes as ambassador, the more relevant branch of the Secretary of State was generally the second section, that is, the section for relations between states, or quote-unquote extraordinary affairs. In other words, affairs outside the church, between nations. This is the portion of the Secretary of State that this ambassador was most connected with. It says the second section, like the U.S. State Department, anybody ask themselves the question, why the government of the Vatican seems to parallel so closely the government of the United States of America, or rather, vice versa, that the government of the United States is constructed almost in mirror image, mirror image of the beast government of Rome. The similarities are purposeful. He says the second section, like the United States State Department, handles relations with other governments. Under the Secretary for Relations with States, a position held by Archbishop Giovanni Loyolo in 2005, the second section is subdivided into geographical concentrations. He divides up the world, right? Is that what the Bible tells about it? <clears throat> the second section is subdivided into geographical concentrations, each headed by a desk officer much like our State Department, much like the United States State Department. They are quite efficient. The entire diplomatic arm of the Vatican, covering 179 countries, employs no more than 80 people, about 30 of these support staff. So very, very close circle of very, very powerful people governing over interest, interstate, that is, affairs between states, at the Vatican. <clears throat> you thought it was just a church, right? <laughs> it's a global government. It's a global government. The Bible's telling the truth. He reigns over the kings of the earth. He says, to handle both civil government and church affairs around the world, the staffs of the first and second sections rely heavily on nuncio. Did, anybody, did it even dawn on you, anybody here that this is a global union of church and state? Listen, to handle both civil government and church affairs around the world, that's civil government affairs and church affairs around the world, the staffs of the first and second sections rely heavily on nuncios, the Holy See's ambassadors. Okay? There's your shadow government. That's the head of the shadow government in every nation is the nuncio. He is the direct representative of the Pope in every nation in the world that has a nuncio. Okay? And the nuncio oversees the bishops, the cardinals and the bishops of every nation. And the bishops oversee every priest. And there are priests in nearly every neighborhood of every city in this country, in every state of this country. That's your shadow government. It's a hierarchical government. It's a foreign government. And it's an anti-Christ government. And it oversees the visible government, Washington, D.C., and the governments of the states. No place in the United States is there not this shadow government. And it rules and reigns over the visible government. All right. The nuncios are the Holy See's foreign diplomats, foreign ambassadors. And it says, posted in most of the countries with which the Vatican maintains diplomatic relations, the nuncios are the Pope's eyes and ears. Okay, that's what shadow governments do. 
They provide the eyes and the ears for the real government of the world, the invisible government. And sometimes his voice. So the Pope speaks to the governments through his nuncios. And do they have to consult the American people before these nuncios talk to the government of the United States? No. No. The papacy answers to no authority, and especially not that of the people. This is directly contrary to the government of the United States as set forth in the Constitution. A government of, by, and for the people when in fact it is a government of, by, and for the papacy. All right. It says, serving in a dual capacity as the Vatican's channel to the local church, the Vatican's channel to the local church, that is the one right down the street from you, the one with the great big parking lot that rings bells every Sunday. Okay. Okay and to the civil government of the nations where they are posted, church and state, the nuncios are a highly trained, well-educated, and diverse group. Most are graduates of the Pontifical Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastical Academy in Rome, the world's first and longest standing school of diplomacy and are experienced in diplomatic affairs, having served on the staff of nunciatures around the world. Given limited Vatican manpower, young would-be diplomats are taught the important communication skill of boiling down complicated situations into several good pages. Quote, to take 100 pages, turn it into three, unquote in the words of Monsignor Peter Wells. Quote, I tell them that if they can't make it short, no one will read it. Unquote. In other words, they are reporting directly. These nuncios are reporting directly to the papacy regarding church and state affairs in whatever nation they are represented. That's your shadow government. They're the eyes and the ears and the mouth of the Pope. You know, that little horn with eyes like eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great blasphemies against the Most High? The nuncios are his eyes, ears, and mouth in every nation. All right, the Pope is the last remaining absolute leader in Europe. His power is hardly without limits, says the author. He is constrained both by the conventions and precedents of the church, that is, Roman Catholic canon law, which I understand the Pope may even violate. He is constrained, says this author, by the conventions and precedents of the church and by the prax practical exigencies of the institution's administration. Although the church is hierarchical, much of its day-to-day -day business is delegated to dioceses around the world. Okay? It's a hierarchical church, and uh, the dioceses are business institutions for the church. They represent the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. The dioceses of the church serve the hierarchical papacy. He says, popes paint the broad strokes, but details are left to the discretion of the local bishops. Okay? The bishop is the governor over the dioceses. The most powerful man in any location, any local location in this country, is the local bishop. He controls the politics. And you thought it was up by and for the people. We'll be back right after the message. You're listening to the Position Update on First
You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased. It has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit discountgoldandsilvertrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support the program, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. Also, if you'd like to contact me, please do so by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Now we'll continue our discussion about the organizational and control structure. That's right, the church and state control structure of the Roman Catholic Church. We have the Pope at the top. We have the papal nuncios, and now we have the local bishops, and they govern the dioceses around the world, not just in the United States. They are the local papal jurisdiction. Each diocese is a local papal uh, jurisdiction headed up by the local bishop, which is the most powerful man within the diocese. You just think your mayor is powerful. The mayor and the city council answer to the local bishop. Everyone answers to the local bishop. And as with most criminal organizations, as is the Roman Catholic Church, there are layer upon layer upon layer of snitches. Okay? The bishops report to uh, the nuncios or the cardinals, the hierarchy of the church. But overseeing the whole thing are the Jesuits. The United States is broken up into ten Jesuit provinces, over which is a Jesuit provincial, and he has visible uh, priests, visible priests organized to oversee all of it. And then they also employ 
Well, normal people, just lay people, plain clothes people, that's the word I was looking for, plain clothes people that, o that oversee everything else and make sure that there's no corruption, that, that the dioceses and the bishops and even the local priests and the parishioners all serve the papacy. And so in plain clothes, in every Roman Catholic Church and in every Protestant Church, there are what one might, would rightly call Jesuit temporal coadjutors and Je Jesuit spiritual coadjutors. They are the, the eyes and the ears of the black pope, the eyes and the ears of the local Jesuit provincial. And so they oversee the, the entire operation, state and religious, church and state, and keep all persons honest. Okay? Keep their loyalties to the Pope. As I said before, just like all criminal organizations, there are layer upon layer upon layer of monitoring to make sure everyone does their job. And the Pope is fully informed and no secrets are kept. Okay? He says, Popes paint the broad strokes, but details are left to the discretion of the local bishops. Okay? The local bishops are the eyes and the ears and the mouth of the Pope, just like the nuncio. They are the most powerful person in every location, the local bishop. You, you sense that there is a controlling power in your, in your city that doesn't seem to really have the, the, the wishes of the people in, in their best interest, but that they are controlled by something else, someone else, somewhere. That's the man, the local bishop, the local Roman Catholic bishop. Every politician knows that if he doesn't have the blessing of the local bishop, he's likely to fall into scandal. Okay? All politicians are threatened by this layer upon layer upon layer of observe, observation and surveillance. And reports are issued. And so every move is carefully choreographed and controlled directly or indirectly by the bishop. Okay? That's why our governments do not respond to the people. They are, to, they are governed by the man of sin. Now it says, when combined in national conferences, such as the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, that's when all the bishops of the United States get together to conference, the bishops wield enormous influence within the church. And they also... I will add, they also wield enormous influence within the state. Okay, this is how the Pope governs his people, through the bishops. And when his people constitute a vast majority of Americans, as is the case today after Vatican Council II, where the, where the papacy actually represents both Roman Catholics, card-carrying Roman Catholics, pew-sitting Roman Catholics, idolatrous Catholics, they, he also represents the ecumenical evangelibellies. So it's not just 25% of the population that the Pope and the bishops are overseers for. It's virtually all of Christianity in this country. Okay? They are a political juggernaut. You cannot oppose these people they have a mandate that's why America is against God's people God's true people are you comprehending what I'm telling you he says combined in national conferences such as the US Conference of Catholic Bishops the bishops wield enormous influence within the church. Now, you must know, if you've paid any attention to this book, 
this U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops also wields controlling influence in the state. They govern the civil law of this country. They oversee the entire political process. That's their purpose. The Roman Catholic Church is first and foremost a political institution disguised as a church. That through that church it, is, it attains to itself the moral authority to oversee the civil government and the laws under which we live. This system that we've just described is how every human person is made subject to the Roman pontiff. Not subject to Christ, but subject to Antichrist. Now let me tell you something else that really, really amplifies the control of the papacy and his laws in this country. Because we have Bible-carrying people all over this country, everywhere you look, that when you ask them about God's laws, they say it's dead, crucified with Christ. The law is dead, crucified with Christ. If you've heard it once, you've heard it a million times. We're not under the law, we're under grace. So where does that leave Roman Catholic canon law? Supreme. Absolutely supreme. The civil law is supreme over God's law, which is done away with, crucified with Christ, and we're under grace. But we're also under Roman Catholic canon law, which has replaced God's law in this land. Now, I didn't plan on this, but I'm going to tell you something. If God is one thing, he is the lawgiver. And he's not an Indian giver. When God gives a law, he gives it, and he doesn't alter a thing that comes forth from his mouth. Now, if it were not for the law of God, there would be no such thing as sin, because sin is the violation of the law. Now, if there is no law and there is no sin, then there are no sinners and no need for Christ. Let me do it again. If God's law is dead, crucified with Christ, and we're not under the law anymore, then there is no sin because sin is the violation of the law. And if there is no sin, there are no sinners, and there is no need for Christ. There's only need for Antichrist and his law, the civil law, Roman Catholic canon law. Do you see how that... You, now, where's the problem? Can somebody tell me where the problem is? It's in the churches who teach that God's law is dead. When you teach that God's law is dead, you are essentially saying we are no longer under God's authority. We are no longer sinners, and we no longer need Christ, but we must uphold the civil power. Romans chapter 13. You see how it works? When you say with your mouth that God's law is dead, you've crucified Christ permanently out of your life. Because coming to redeem us from our sin, because we violated the law, the holy, eternal, immutable law of God, He is our Savior. And to say that his law is dead is to say we don't know, we no longer need a savior. And that's why all the emphasis is placed on Romans chapter 13 where it seems to indicate that we are to obey the higher power. Who is the highest power? 
Christ. So the state is to be a servant of the higher power. And if the state is the servant of the higher power, Christ, then we are to obey that, say, that, that, that higher power. The Bible plainly says the state is to reward good and to punish evil. Not to determine what is good and what is evil, but to reward good and to punish evil. Who determines what is good and what is evil? God. Through what mechanism? His law. Is God's law really dead like virtually all Christians say today with their mouths? That's why they're lawless. They pay lip service to Christ, but they serve Antichrist. Such is our government today. It's a well-known maxim that if you're not governed by God, then you will be tyrannized by a tyrant. And is not the world governed today by the tyrant, the biblical tyrant, the papacy? Does the civil gov government serve God, or does it serve the man of sin? The whole book that we've been reading tells us that our government serves the man of sin. I hope this is sinking in. It's an antichrist government because the government serves the antichrist. And who's not welcome to that kingdom? Those who wouldn't go if they were invited. I have a king. I have a kingdom. I have a constitution and I have a law. They are all perfect. And they are all eternal, immutable, eternal and immutable, benevolent, holy, never to be compared with the earthly counterfeit. And this is how the man of sin governs the world, the organizational structure, the power structure, <coughs> of the one who lords it over God's heritage. The shadow government, hidden in plain sight, on the most wealthy corner in every neighborhood, the Roman Catholic Church, headed up by his bishops, who get together for the conference of U.S. Catholic bishops who answer to the nuncios, the Jesuits and their Jesuit temporal and spiritual coadjutors monitoring the whole system, all report to Rome, the man of sin, and the civil power imposes by coercion, by force, a threat of imprisonment, threat of persecution, threat of IRS persecution, those who hold to Christ. The whole system is designed to oppose Christ. Are you proud to call yourself an American? Are you still wondering where the United States of America is, is, is uh, brought up in Bible prophecy? It's Revelation chapter 13. We were talking about Romans 13. Try to look at Revelation chapter 13. It describes two beasts. One who rose up out of the sea. Peoples, nations, tongues, and kindreds. Europe. The Roman Empire. And then the second beast. It comes along later. Rises, rose up out of the wilderness. Unchurched. Never heard the gospel. And it causes, eventually, causes the whole world to worship the first beast. The one that rose up out of the sea. You see, that first beast received a mortal wound, but then was revived. And who revived it? The United States of America. 
when the papacy had been rejected all over Europe, even the Roman Catholic nations, Italy included, had rejected the temporal power of the Pope, the United States has become a rebuilder of that holy Roman Empire of the papacy. You can attribute the rise of Antichrist to no one else but the United States of America and its allies. It's a hideous reality, but it's no less real. He says, when combined in national conferences, such as the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the bishops wield enormous influence within the church. All decisions and pronouncements are meant to be coordinated with the Vatican. So are state affairs. Don't forget, it's a church-state system, which is to say with the Pope. All decisions and pronouncements are meant to be coordinated with the Vatican, which is to say with the Pope, but the conferences ask, act with significant de degree of independence. Remember, the, po the Pope paints the broad strokes and the bishops give the detail. That's your shadow government. Hidden in plain sight, where would you hide a tree? Where would you, you know, make it most difficult to find a tree? In a forest. And we've got a forest of churches in this country that all seem to represent Christ. But there's one that represents Antichrist that controls all the other churches. And it's hidden among them. You can barely discern the difference until God opens your eyes. God, the Bible, and history. He says, complicating matters further are dozens of orders of priests and nuns, from Jesuits to Dominicans to Carmelites, all with their own structures and perspectives, and all with their own jobs, purposes to serve the Antichrist of the Bible, each forming a satellite of power outside the Vatican. That's right, a satellite of power outside outside the Vatican and in your neighborhood. Layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of control and surveillance and where's room for Christ? He says, like local bishops, these orders fall nominally under the domain of the Pope but only in general terms. For the most part, they operate under their own jurisdictions and authority. Finally, of course, there are individual priests and nuns whose daily behavior the Vatican cannot possibly supervise closely. A large part of the Vatican's task is to attempt to unify these various factions and personalities under a single and consistent message. What do you suppose that single and consistent message is? The Pope is God on this earth. The God of this world. He says, even if it were possible to draw a flow chart of the circuits of power within the Catholic Church, it would fail to capture the human aspect. As in any bureaucracy, the personalities who occupy the positions define them more completely than any job description. The curia is populated by men of God, says this author, but they are human nonetheless, and they bring strengths and weaknesses to their office. This is true at all levels. Pope Benedict XVI, for instance, obviously had a very different style than Pope John Paul II and used his authority differently. Whereas John Paul II was an extrovert, a powerful stage presence, and his own best spokesman, Pope Benedict XVI was an academic and an intense intellectual. Neither type is necessarily better than the other, but the Pope's personality and predilections will inevitably affect the office he holds and the entire tenor of the Vatican. In other words, they're not God. They vary among themselves. They even 
contradict one another as history is revealed as even in included in this book you see it's a very poor counterfeit of the truth but this author and our government and virtually every church and every political mechanism within your neighborhood is also friendly to this system and if you worship Jesus Christ and him only you're bound to run afoul of any and all of those that I just mentioned the truth the real truth the biblical historical and prophetic truth is not well welcomed in the churches today Christ is mentioned in name only but the entire system serves the man of sin and if you want to serve Christ my best advice is to get out of those churches form your own church make Christ the head of your congregation and help resist the Antichrist become a true Protestant now chapter 12 is entitled new friends new friends it begins with a quote from communist Mikhail Gorbachev quote everything that happened in Eastern Europe would have been impossible without the Pope unquote during spare moments in Rome I often thought about the great wealth of history that had passed through the Vatican says the author not just the distant history but also the more recent past the previous 20 years alone had furnished an abundance of dramatic episodes starting with those great days in the late 1980s when communism gradually crumbled throughout Eastern Europe the end came pretty much as the KGB's gloomiest prognosticators had predicted Following the Pope's visit to Poland in 1979, the spirit of freedom spread into other Catholic countries in the Soviet Empire, then in a kind of reverence domino effect into the Catholic provinces of Russia itself. The Soviets did everything in their power to stop it, but they could not. Many forces combined to end communism in Eastern Europe, the most obvious being the failure of communism itself as an ideology and system of government. The efforts of the United States and its allies, especially Margaret Thatcher's Britain, did much to accelerate the process, but the role of the Catholic Church must not be overlooked. What the Holy See lacks in guns, money, and economic leverage, it supplied in moral authority the unique effective exercise of soft power. Much of this soft power emanated from the fact that the church, unlike the communist governments, could be trusted. That's right, the man of sin could be trusted. A world of sin and deception. And you can hardly cut it with a chainsaw. We'll be back next time on Inquisition Up. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all 
this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.